Okay, so this is laboratory number six. We're going to be doing muscle strength and fatigue. All right, so uh, the first thing we'll look at is the structure of muscle. So you can see in the bottom left of your screen, uh, we have a whole skeletal muscle. Uh, and then we can break this down into uh, smaller parts as we go along. So the first thing we can look at is a muscle fascicle. Uh, and then this is composed up of multiple muscle fibers. Uh, and then within each muscle fiber, there are myofibrils. So you can see this is at the top of our screen here. And a myofibril is composed of uh, many sarcomeres lined up uh, in series. So that's, that means that there's uh, many sarcomeres lined up uh, right next to each other in a nice uh, line. And so the sarcomere is considered the uh, major functional unit of muscle. Uh, and we can look inside a sarcomere and we can see that the purple lines here are thick filaments and the pink lines are thin filaments. Uh, so we can work our way down and we can see that uh, the actin filaments uh, in the pink and the thick filaments in the purple line up uh, nicely within each other. And then you see this is the basic uh, format for the sliding filament theory of contraction. So you can see that the thin filaments will be pulled by the myosin heads and the thin filaments will be pulled towards each other. So this is the sliding filament theory of contraction, that the filaments slide past each other. And the sliding filament theory of contraction is something that you might want to know, will probably come up on a test at some point. Uh, the sliding filament theory of contraction was developed in 1954 by a couple of men uh, named Huxley, who actually weren't related. They came up with the, this, uh, this theory uh, independently. So. Uh, and they came up with the fact that myosin heads will pull the thin filaments towards each other and the muscle will contract in this format. And so we can look even further at myosin and actin as we go down on the right side of the screen. We have an actin filament uh, right here and it's wrapped around uh, by troponin and tropomyosin. Uh, these are two regulatory proteins that we'll talk about in a minute. But this is our actin filament uh, and this interacts with uh, myosin. So this is a myosin head that goes through a power stroke, so it moves just 10 nanometers. So with this little power stroke generated uh, by ATP is 10 nanometers, uh, it binds the actin, goes through 10, 10 nanometer displacement, and it causes the uh, muscles to contract. Now 10 nanometers isn't very far at all, but if you have so many myosin heads, uh, it will cause uh, a lot of movement and a lot of force. Right. So the sliding filament theory of contraction is that all of these myosin heads produce force and uh, a distance, and it's additive, so all these myosin heads can produce a lot of force uh, and a lot of uh, velocity. Alright, so this is the uh, pathway of force production. So it starts off with the primary motor cortex, uh, and a signal is sent down, and action potential goes down the spinal cord, uh, and then the action potential will go down a motor neuron. Uh, so there are a couple of, of terms that we should be familiar with here. So first of all, the, the motor neuron is just a, a neuron that uh, innervates a muscle fiber. Right? And a motor unit uh, is an important definition. A motor unit is an alpha motor neuron in all the fibers it innervates. So we can see that we have an alpha motor neuron here in the purple. So an alpha motor neuron will uh, go down and it will innervate uh, multiple muscle fibers. Here this motor unit has two fibers. Right, so a motor unit is an alpha motor neuron in all the fibers it innervates. Okay, so now uh, going further down the pathway of force production, uh, we can see where the the neuron meets the muscle in the bottom left of your screen. Uh, so this is called the neuromuscular junction, right? Neuromuscular junction where the neuron meets the muscle, uh, also called the NMJ. So here the uh, neuron releases acetylcholine, represented as ACH in the bottom of your screen here. Right, and this causes another action potential that goes down the outside of the muscle. Okay, so now the action potential uh, has excited the muscle and it goes down the outside of the muscle, down the sarcolemma of the muscle. Uh, and then we can go up here and we can see that this action potential goes down and it hits a T-tubule. Uh, so it goes down a T-tubule, and the T-tubules are close to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this is important because the sarcoplasmic reticulum holds a lot of calcium. Okay, so the action pot potential goes down the muscle, uh, it excites the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that releases a lot of calcium. Okay, so the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or the SR, uh, has all this calcium in it, and it releases the calcium, uh, and then finally, this is where the troponin and tropomyosin come into play. So I mentioned these before. 
they are regulatory proteins that wrap around the actin filament. Okay, so calcium will bind to troponin, uh, which will cause troponin and tropomyosin to shift, uh, and so now they shift their position on actin. Now this is important because usually uh, they block the active sites on actin. So they block the sites where myosin can bind to actin. But now when calcium comes in, uh, it shifts, and now myosin can bind to actin uh, and produce force and velocity. Okay, so these are regulatory proteins. They regulate the action between myosin and actin. Okay, so usually myosin can't bind to actin. That's why when you're at rest, uh, you don't feel any contractions because these regulatory proteins are blocking myosin from binding to actin. But when calcium comes in, they shift out of the way, and now myosin can bind with actin uh, and cause force and velocity. Uh, so another thing that we can talk about is maximal strength. So there's a lot of things that come into play, like training status, age, gender, but uh, probably the most significant thing is muscle cross-sectional area. And so uh, we can see a picture here of a young individual and an old individual, uh, and this is uh, a cross-sectional view of the lower leg. Okay, so we're seeing the muscles in the lower leg between a young individual and an old individual. Uh, we can see that the younger individual has more muscle mass, and we can see that the older individual has a nice white ring uh, on the outside, and that's all fat. Okay, and then we can see, uh, especially highlighted in the yellow, that the younger individual has much more cross-sectional area of muscle than the older individual. And cross-sectional area is important because the more fibers that you have in parallel, right, we talked about uh, muscle fibers and myo we talked about myofibrils, and we talked about muscle fibers and muscle fascicles, right, as we work our way up in, in scale. If you have more muscle fibers uh, in parallel, it'll produce more strength, right? If you can imagine if you have more of these myosin-actin interactions happening, and you have more of them lined up in parallel, the more strength you'll have, right? So the more cross-sectional area you have of muscle, the more strength you'll be able to produce. All right, so now we can run through a couple of the uh, differences between muscle fiber types, right? We have three uh, fiber types. So two of them are considered fast fibers, that's type 2X and type 2A, and then some are considered slow fibers, which are type 1 fibers. And then there are uh, some major differences, especially in the characteristics of these fibers that we'll talk about right now. So one of which uh, is the number of mitochondria. So type 1 fibers have a high amount of mitochondria. They use mostly aerobic systems, they use a lot of oxygen. Uh, meanwhile, type 2X fibers have very little mitochondria. So you can imagine if they have very little mitochondria, they won't be using a lot of aerobic processes. Uh, they're going to stick mostly to anaerobic processes like uh, ATP-PCR reactions and glycolysis. Uh, then we can look at the resistance to fatigue. So uh, type 1 fibers are very resistant to fatigue. They have a high resistance to fatigue uh, because they have so many mitochondria and they're able to use oxygen. Uh, they have uh, a good supply of ATP. Right. However, type 2 X fibers are not so resistant to fatigue. Fatigue happens uh, very quickly. They use ATP, PCR, and glycolysis. So you can imagine that they have a lot of production of uh, hydrogen ions. The pH reduces very quickly, uh, and this can cause fatigue. Uh, so I, I kind of alluded to this before. The predominant energy system is mostly anaerobic for the type 2 X fibers. It is mostly aerobic for the type 1 fibers. So again, the type 1 fibers that are aerobic have a lot of mitochondria, uh, and they're going to use they're going to use these mitochondria, and they're going to use the oxidative phosphorylation system to produce uh, ATP. Meanwhile, the type 2 X fibers are mostly anaerobic, so they're going to use ATP PCR, and they're going to use glycolysis. Uh, so another thing we can look at is the ATPase activity. So uh, one thing I didn't mention before, uh, but maybe you already know, is that myosin uh, that produces the force and uh, velocity that we need for muscle contraction uses an ATP molecule. So it uses one ATP molecule to go through that power stroke. Uh, and it can go through a cycle where it uses an ATP molecule, uh, generates that 10 nanometer displacement, and then comes off of actin, it recocks, it binds again, and it goes through this cycle, the cross-bridge cycle, where it uses an ATP molecule on each cycle, uh, and it can generate force and movement. So uh, there's actually subtle differences in the myosins 
between a type 2 X fiber and a type 1 fiber. And these differences cause uh, a difference in the ATPase activity. So the type 2 X fibers have the highest ATPase activity, which means it can go through this cross bridge cycle much faster than a slow twitch fiber. All right, so right along those lines, uh, if a myosin molecule can go through this ATPase activity much quicker and go through the whole cross bridge cycle quicker, you can imagine that the uh, filaments will slide past each other uh, and the speed of shortening will be highest in a type 2 X fiber. Where you have all these myosin heads that are working uh, very quickly and they are producing that 10 nanometer displacement. And if they're doing it very quickly, then the speed of shortening will be very quick in a type 2 X fiber. Uh, meanwhile, the speed of shortening is a little bit slower uh, in a slow twitch fiber. So um, this is something that might be easy to remember because the Vmax uh, is highest in a fast fiber. So fast fibers are fast, and it's low in a slow fiber, so slow fibers are slow. Uh, and then the efficiency is highest in a type 1 fiber. So this is kind of the efficiency uh, velocity trade-off. Type 1 fibers are actually most efficient uh, you can think of this like, uh, you know, type 1 fibers have a lot of mitochondria. Uh, they're very efficient because the mitochondria can produce 32 ATPs. Or the oxidative phosphorylation system can produce 32 ATPs for one glucose molecule. Meanwhile, the anaerobic systems that you mostly see in type 2 X fibers uh, can only get two ATPs out for a, a glucose molecule. So the type 1 fibers with all the mitochondria uh, and get all these ATPs for one glucose molecule are the most efficient. Uh, and then finally, uh, type 2 X fibers can produce uh, a little bit more force than type 1 fibers. So the specific tension or force is highest in a type 2 X fiber. Uh, and then on the bottom of your screen, you can see a staining uh, for muscle. The, so this staining was done by uh, staining different fibers based on the myosin type. So like I said before, the myosin uh, slightly different between fiber types, uh, so you can stain the muscle fiber looking for certain, looking for those differences. Uh, and when you stain the, the muscle fiber, uh, you can see that the the fibers show up different color based on the the myosin type. So this muscle looks like it has a good mix of all the fiber types, as you can tell by all the different colors uh, in the in the picture. 